Welcome to the Atlantico podcast, where we talk about the science behind the Atlantico project, the Atlantic Ocean, and the human adventures experienced along the way. Here, we have conversations with guests from around the world who work together so that we can better understand, manage, and protect the ocean. So let's embark on the journey of Atlantico and discover the world that lies above and beneath the surface of the beautiful Atlantic Ocean. Welcome back to the Atlantico podcast. Today we have an episode in our Science of Atlantico series with our guest Chris Baumer. Chris is going to tell us about marine biodiversity so that we can get a better understanding of what biodiversity is, why it is important to study marine biodiversity, and more specifically, the diversity of microorganisms in our ocean. So welcome to the podcast, Chris. It is a pleasure to have you as a guest today. Thank you, Eloise. It's great to be here. So to start with, and as with all previous episodes, we will start by getting to know you. So can you tell us about yourself, how and when your connection to the ocean started, and about your journey from that point, the starting point, to where you are now doing what you do these days? Right, sure. So I'm currently a, a CNRS scientist. Um, I'm based in France in the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. I've been here for 20 years. And yeah, rightly so. Um, Paris is not necessarily the first place you think of when you think of marine sciences. And equally, I started off my life very far from, from the oceans. Um, I was born in the middle of England, in Derbyshire, in beautiful countryside. But the ocean was very far from my thoughts. Uh, I went to university in the UK. I subsequently did a PhD in Belgium. And uh, I studied microbiology, I studied plants, but I only really started thinking about the ocean during the time that I was staying in the, in the Stazione Zoologica in Naples, where I worked for 10 years in the 1990s. And being a marine biological station of, uh, of quite some international renown, this is where I sort of started getting curious about the ocean and thinking about you know, what me as a scientist could contribute to understanding more about ocean life. And as my particular interest is photosynthesis and photosynthetic organisms, um, I started studying the, the phytoplankton in the ocean, which are the, the plants of the ocean, basically. So there you go, it's a bit of a contorted journey, as it often is in science, uh, but a very enjoyable journey nonetheless. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, in today's episode, we want to talk about biodiversity. And we should probably start off from a wide perspective before zooming in towards the specific kind of biodiversity that we study in Atlantico. Uh, so maybe to start with, could you explain what marine biodiversity is and what role it plays, uh, not only in the ocean, but also for us on land? Right. Well, first of all, let me ask a question. What do we think about? when we think about marine biodiversity. I think most people would typically think about, you know, coral reefs, they'd maybe think about dolphins and whales, and the sorts of things that we typically see on TV that we associate uh, with marine biodiversity. And, and yes, all of that is important, but in fact, the majority of biodiversity, the majority of life in the ocean is microscopic. This is not what you see on TV typically. But in fact, two thirds of the biomass, the, the weight of carbon in life in the ocean, two thirds of, of the biomass is microscopic. And that is our interest in particular in the Atlantico project. And there are all kinds of organisms that, that make up this, this, this microscopic world. Particularly important to understand these organisms because they essentially determine the well-being of the ocean. And so this is what we want to learn more about when we're studying these organisms. How, what sort of functions do they do in the ocean? How do they determine the well-being of the ocean? And what happens when the, the marine microbiome doesn't work well? So in a nutshell, that is, our, that is our sort of interest. Now, when we think about biodiversity, we can think of biodiversity in terms of different metrics. One way of thinking of biodiversity is simply number of species on land, which is the most dominant group of organisms in terms of number of species. 
think about it for a second. The answer is insects. All right, insects is a group with by far the, the highest biodiversity on land. Okay. What is the group of organisms that are most biodiverse in the ocean? They're actually called diplonemids. They're microscopic. You never heard of them. We never heard of them before making this discovery. Uh, we think they're sort of parasitic. Uh, but we don't really know. So the diplonemids are the insects of the ocean, microscopic organisms, which is quite uh, pretty much unknown and unappreciated, I think, to pretty much everybody. Um, another metric of, of biodiversity is abundance, abundance of organisms, the actual weight of organisms. So which are the most abundant organisms on land? Um, think about that for a second. The most abundant organisms on land are not insects, but they are plants. OK, on land, the land is green. So the, the majority of, of biomass of biodiversity on land are the plants. So a very different metric to the insects. In the ocean, what are the most abundant in terms of biomass in the ocean? It's not whales, it's not corals, it's not what you might think it is, but it's actually a group of organisms called radiolarians. These are, again, microscopic organisms, underappreciated, but these have the most amount of biomass in the ocean, the radiolarians. So there you go, differences in terms of land and ocean and biodiversity in general. Wow. So that's a lot to take in and uh, kind of makes us wonder, you know, what we know and what we think uh, when we think about the life on Earth and life in the ocean. You know, as you said, we don't hear about these organisms and they make up a, a lot of our world. Exactly, exactly. So if we get a closer look into the ocean and towards this specific part of life present uh, in the ocean, the, the microbiomes, those microscopic organisms that you were mentioning, um, when we talk about marine microbiome, what exactly are we talking about? Which organisms are we talking about? Right. OK. So when you look at the ocean, you don't necessarily see it teeming with life. Right. When you when you go into a forest, you see the plants, you see the animals, you see the insects. But in the ocean, it looks kind of empty. And that is because actually the, the biomass of life in the ocean is something like 100 times less than it is on land. But nonetheless, it's full of lots of organisms that have equivalent functions as we find on land of equivalent importance. So, for example, one group of organisms that we have in the ocean are the photosynthetic organisms, the plants. Now, you don't really see the plants in the ocean besides the seaweeds, the macroalgae uh, when you're by the coast. But the majority of plants, of photosynthetic organisms in the ocean, are microscopic. They're single-celled. But even though they're tiny, we need a microscope to see them, they're actually re responsible for 50% of the photosynthesis on our planet. So they have an equivalent importance as all of the forests uh, and fields on land in terms of the amount of photosynthesis being performed. Photosynthesis means organic material that is generated, which provides food for the food chains. Photosynthesis also means oxygen, uh, which is generated by photosynthesis, which a lot of organisms breathe. And so in all these different ways, the photosynthesis in the ocean performed by these tiny microscopic phytoplankton is exactly the same as the photosynthesis of all of the trees and the plants on land. So we have this group of photosynthetic organisms. They're very diverse, very interesting to study. And this is what I study in particular. In addition to these photosynthetic organisms, we have organisms called zooplankton. So zooplankton can be like herbivores. These are sort of the equivalent of the cows and the sheep, but these are also microscopic. They eat the microscopic phytoplankton uh, and they can be single celled. They can have multicellular structures like copepods, small jellyfish, things like that, gelatinous organisms. They may be herbivores eating the, the microscopic plants. They may be parasites, they may be pathogens, they have all kinds of different uh, uh, lifestyles. In addition to these, we have also bacteria. We have lots and lots and lots of bacteria in the ocean. Uh, some of these may be photosynthetic, like cyanobacteria. And some of them are not photosynthetic, but they consume sugars, they consume organic material that is present in the ocean to, to recycle the organic material in the ocean, essentially. Their job is to recycle the material. 
In addition to the bacteria, we also have viruses. Viruses are the smallest component of living material in the ocean. But just because you're small doesn't mean you're not important. And we all know with, with the COVID crisis these days, we see that even the smallest organisms can be incredibly powerful. So the viruses are also very important in this, in this microscopic world. When we consider the marine microbiome, we tend to think about all of these organisms and try to understand how they work together within this, this microscopic ecosystem uh, that is so important to determine the, the, the well-being of the ocean in general. This is also kind of equivalent to the human microbiome, which maybe many people are more familiar with. The human microbiome consists of microbes that live in our intestines, that live on our skin. There are trillions of, uh, of cells of bacteria uh, on and within us, and they really determine our state of health, and they also determine our sort of state of well-being. There's even studies showing that you know, what the microbiome is doing on our skin or inside our guts determines sort of, you know, whether we wake up feeling good or whether we wake up feeling lousy and, and, and so on. So microbes, even though they're small, they're, they're incredibly important for everything, really, uh, the functioning of all of the life on our planet and uh, including ourselves, of course. So they are, as we've seen in, in the previous episode that was introducing, you know, the marine microbiome, they are the start of the food chain. Yeah, as you say, really important in the cycle of life. Yeah, they are the start of the food chain, channeling organic material up the food chain to the larger organisms. And they are also the recyclers. They decompose material in the ocean. Uh, they recycle material. So you know, these multiple functions uh, are really important, as, as we know, in, in sort of the functioning of our own daily lives. Yes, we need to eat, uh, but we also produce garbage, which needs to be recycled to ensure that the whole system can function in sort of a circular way. And the, the microbes in the ocean do that, assuring the functions in different ways of the whole system such that it can, that it can be healthy. Yeah, yeah. And so to come back maybe to, to Atlantico in the project, we study these organisms with genetic and genomics techniques. So first of all, uh, can you explain what these techniques are? What does it mean? And secondly, what do we uh, already and what will we learn from applying these to the marine microbiomes that we find in the Atlantic? Yeah, so because these organisms are microscopic, we can't see them with the naked eye, like we can see life in a forest when we go to study a forest ecosystem. We need special tools to visualize these organisms. One set of tools that are incredibly powerful are, are based on what we call genomics, which is basically DNA-based studies, so sequencing of DNA. All organisms contain DNA or nucleic acids, it consists of just four letters, okay? So unlike our alphabet, which has A, B, C, D, E, 26 letters, the alphabet of the genome is just four letters, G, A, T, and C. All organisms possess those four letters, and they possess very long strings of those letters. And by studying those strings of Gs, As, Ts, and Cs, we can divine sort of what we call barcodes of organisms. So just like you go in a supermarket, and a barcode can be used to indicate, you know, where a product comes from, how much does it cost, uh, et cetera. The barcodes of DNA are very useful to tell us the identity of a species and to tell us what sort of functions it may perform. So the, the DNA is incredibly important to provide us with these barcodes that allow us to identify all of these different organisms that are present in this microscopic world. And there are millions of different organisms. So it's a very complex process to dissect, to disentangle all of that DNA-based information. Uh, but fortunately, these days, we have a lot of young people that are very smart in computer sciences, and they do the job to disentangle all of this huge array of, uh, of, of DNA-based information, which is great. But at the end of the day, DNA sure is very powerful, but it's still one-dimensional at the end, right? It's just a string of G's, A's, T's, and C's. So it's not sort of the whole story 
of microscopic life in the ocean, we need additional tools to help us figure out what organisms are present in this microscopic world and what are they doing. And one technique that we use a lot in Atlantico is, is microscopy. So microscopes, just like telescopes, they allow us to see things that the human eye cannot see. Microscopes have been around since the 1600s, but these days the microscopes that we use are incredibly powerful. They allow us to see sort of uh, the outside of cells and they allow us to dig deep into the interior of cells to see all kinds of different things. So by adding together the, the, the one-dimensional DNA-based information with the three-dimensional microscopic information, we can get a pretty complete picture of all of the organisms that are present in, uh, in different marine environments. So that's sort of what tools that we use to explore these invisible ecosystems. Nice. And uh, and what can we hope to learn from, from studying these animals in all those different dimensions? Yeah, a couple of examples, what we can use this information for. One example is these organisms are an incredible bioresource of, of new genes, of new molecules. You can think of this as really the, the treasure trove of the ocean. These microscopic organisms, they have thousands of genes, many of which we, we don't know about yet, that encode for different processes in the cells. And some of these processes we can think to use and exploit in our own daily lives. For example, to develop new drugs for beating cancer, for beating diabetes, against some of our you know, terrible illnesses like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. We can try to look for these drugs in the ocean. We can also find new materials that are useful in our daily lives, like adhesives, like glues, like abrasives, all these kinds of industrial materials, which today we derive from, from petroleum, from fossil fuels. We could hope to replace the fossil fuels with these kinds of natural products in the coming decades, we would hope. So that's one sort of resource that we can imagine from uh, this, this treasure trove of organisms in the ocean. And another thing that we could try to do is to, is to use the information from the ocean microbiome to define a sort of microbiome health index for the ocean. So as I say, that the, these organisms, these communities, determine the, the well-being of the ocean. Um, if we could use these organisms as sort of a diagnostic, uh, if we could you know, categorize these communities and define you know, a healthy ecosystem, by the organisms, by the, by the activities that are happening within that microbial community uh, and distinguish it from an unhealthy ecosystem, a polluted ecosystem or an ecosystem very much impacted by, by agricultural runoff or by antibiotics and other chemicals coming out of cities by the coast, then we can use these organisms as what we can call a, a, a microbiome health index. So just by doing DNA-based analyses of the microbial communities, we can define a gradient of, of healthiness of the ocean, which can help us then implement measures to maybe make a, an ecosystem more healthy by intervening in agriculture, by intervening in other processes. So this is how we could sort of hope to develop sort of a diagnostic tool uh, where we use these microbes to tell us about the health of of an ecosystem and also as a uh, as a preventive tool by monitoring a microbiome health index this would allow us to uh, perhaps spot alarm signals before they manifest themselves in in more catastrophic ways so the health index of the ocean based on the microbial content of the ecosystem and the activities of the microbes that uh, could be a very promising approach for the future i think these things are all interesting in the context of the Atlantico project. Yeah, for sure. And, and because we study also the environment within which the, these microbes evolve, if we put all of this information together, uh, what we hope for is to develop these models that can help us sort of predict the status of the ocean in different regions of the Atlantic. And as you say, you know, better manage uh, what is happening and prevent maybe some bad things from happening in, in regions before they actually happen. That's amazing what we can learn from these tiny, tiny things that we can't even see. Exactly. 
And maybe to finish with, if we want to look into the future, I'm just asking, you know, in your opinion, what could we expect in the coming years in terms of new technologies for studying the marine microbiomes? Is there anything coming up on the horizon? Yeah, there's lots of things being developed. And as is often the case in science, new advances are driven by new technologies. Sometimes in science, you have a huge intellectual leap, uh, but oftentimes the advances in science are driven by a new technology that comes along that opens up our eyes to some uh, unexplored phenomena. In the case of exploration of the ocean microbiome, well, on the one hand, our technologies are becoming more and more powerful. Sequencing DNA, for example, uh, new microscopic methods are getting more and more powerful. They're steadily getting cheaper as well. So for the same amount of money, you can do more analyses. This is gonna continue into the future, I expect. On the other hand, some of the instrumentation is becoming smaller, uh, it's becoming miniaturized, and it's becoming automated, which means that some equipment which traditionally is in a laboratory on land, you can now start to think about putting it on a ship and doing your analyses rather than in, in a lab on land, doing them actually on board a research vessel or even a smaller vessel out at sea. This totally changes what you can do in oceanography because you can really study a phenomenon while you're out at sea. You can get the results on the same day that you are sampling, and then you can adjust your scientific questions immediately to then go and do you know, a slightly different sampling program the following day. This completely revolutionizes oceanography, which is typically done you know, more with back and forth between land and sea that takes several years. So these uh, miniaturization automation are radically changing the way we do oceanography. This is likely to continue in the future. And perhaps, you know, 10 years, 20 years from now, we can actually do DNA sequencing in the water. We can image the organisms in the water on like autonomous floats that are drifting around the ocean. So perhaps we can study the ocean microbiome without the need for uh, you know, expensive research vessels going out and sampling. If we have a whole array of sensors that we put out in the ocean that are steadily sequencing DNA, steadily imaging DNA actually in the water, beaming back that information via satellite back to laboratories such as myself on land, um, then this will again totally revolutionize the way that we do science and the way that we study the microbiome in the ocean. So this will gather a lot more data than what we have today. Coming back to your point about, yeah, the need for having a lot of data sort of at the all Atlantic level, which will allow us to sort of detect uh, warning signals of an ecosystem in a particular environment that is starting to go haywire. By having these autonomous arrays of uh, uh, instrumentation deployed at sea, we will be able to gather that information you know, ideally at sort of the all Atlantic level, which will give us then the statistical power that we need in our analyses to be able to identify, yes, what really is a healthy ocean microbiome and what is an unhealthy ocean microbiome and where are the warning signals that we can use to tell us, you know, when an ecosystem starts to get uh, out of balance and in what way does it get out of balance and what could we eventually try to do to restore the balance in the future? So there's plenty of things on the horizon. It's certainly a very exciting time. And you don't even necessarily have to be a scientist to get involved. This miniaturization, these new technologies, these days are also permitting uh, more and more citizens to get involved in science. So just like you know, the general public, the interested citizens really contribute a lot to ornithology, to looking at bird migrations in Europe, around the world, much like the general public really contributes to astronomy by identifying, you know, new stars, new phenomena in space. We can hope that more and more citizens will be able to get involved in ocean sciences as well, to collect samples, identify organisms using, you know, cheap little microscopes and, and so on. So, there's plenty of ways, I think, that oceanography is likely to change in the future and will allow us to generate a lot more data from the ocean, which will allow us to, to increase our understanding 
of how the ocean works and how the microbes assure the well-being of the ocean system. So a lot of, uh, as you say, exciting times to, to be doing oceanography, and not only for, for the scientists, but for anyone really who, uh, who maybe get their hands on, the, on one of those small microscopes. I mean, those things can be adapted to your mobile phone now. You can take pictures of, of these microorganisms using your, your cell phone. So... Yeah, indeed. And yeah, you know, as we know, you know, seeing is believing, you know, when you look at the ocean, you maybe don't appreciate all of these microbes that are present. But if you could see them, uh, then suddenly your eyes are open to this amazing microscopic world that is so important for managing the well-being of the ocean. And since, yeah, the ocean is our joint responsibility, we all have to play a role in looking after the ocean uh, preserving its well-being, these new approaches will will hopefully give more people the opportunity to actually participate uh, and contribute to to making the ocean the healthy, well looked after place that we all dream about. I think that's a beautiful place to end our conversation today, Chris. So I have to thank you for taking yeah, your, your time to explain to us what uh, biodiversity is, which we started with, and then on our journey to understanding more about this microscopic world in the ocean and how everybody can get involved. For our listeners, we will be having some conversations with projects that are developing those centers that Chris was talking about. And also with uh, people that work on making those microscopes that can be used and accessed by the citizens so that they can participate in generating that data and that knowledge. So keep coming back to the podcast to learn more about how we study the ocean and how everybody can get involved. Uh, but for today, again, Chris, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you today, Eloise. <laughs> We hope that you've enjoyed today's episode and look forward to seeing you next time. You can follow the Atlantical Project on our website on www.atlantical.eu and you can also find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. All the links and information on the project and on today's episode is in the show notes. Atlantico is a project funded under Horizon 2020, a European Union research and innovation programme.